President Snow is the villain that everyone hates in the Hunger Games, but there's one character who I think is worse than him, and that is President Alma Coyne. She's a power-hungry tyrant who has a very interesting story that I feel most people forget about. In this video, I'm going to cover Coyne's entire life, from her early life, to her rise to power, to her fall from power, and look at deeper meanings throughout her arc in the novels. With the new Hunger Games book coming out, I know a lot of people are getting into the series for the first time, so I feel I have to say that there will be major spoilers for the series in this video. Before we start, I just wanted to say that I'm going to stop using the YouTube community tab as much as I have been, and start using other platforms more so that the Movie Flame brand extends past just YouTube, just in case the worst happened and I lost the channel or something. So make sure you follow me on Twitter, which is the most important, because that will sort of replace the YouTube community tab. I'll be posting the most updates there, and that's linked down below. You can also follow us on Facebook, and if you want, you can follow my personal Instagram as well, which is full of cute dogs, behind-the-scenes movie flame stuff, and just some fun posts. Both of those are linked down below as well. Now, let's get started. Alma Coin was born in District 13, about 25 years after the Dark Days, the time when the capital started the Hunger Games, and in the book, she's described as having green eyes and straight hair. District 13 was a place that the rest of the country of Panem, besides a few higher ups in the capital, thought was non existent and extinct after a bombing. However, they secretly lived underground and had built an entire civilization. As Quinn grew up, she followed the rigid structure that kept District 13 running so well. Every morning, she'd wake up, get a temporary tattoo with her schedule for that day, telling her where she had to be and what tasks she had to perform. When she was young, it mostly included school, and Quinn was educated in basic math, reading, and writing, and she learned the history of Pan Am and the part that their district played in that history. As she got older and she finished school, Quinn was put to work. The district ran by using each citizen's skills and background, whether that be working in the kitchens, working in the hospitals, or being part of the district's military. It's not known what task Quinn was told to do, but seeing as she eventually becomes president, it can be speculated that she helped in running the overall district, helped with their government, and probably worked closely with the president before her, helping them make the tough decisions. Quinn eventually took over as president, and she was a natural leader. One of the biggest complications that she had to face during her time as president was a smallpox outbreak that wiped out a huge number of their population and made many of those that survived infertile, meaning they were running the risk of dying out. Though this video is based on the books and not the films, as there are many differences, there is one thing that the films added that I think is worth mentioning. According to Prim, Quinn lost her husband and daughter during the smallpox epidemic, leaving her a widow and a heartbroken mother. The reason I wanted to include this is because a loss like this is probably one of the reasons why she turned out the way she did as a savage person and a savage leader. Coin helped the district bounce back from the smallpox outbreak, and though their numbers were smaller, they still thrived under Coin's leadership. Since the day of going underground, District 13 had planned on striking back against the capital, and realizing that that time was coming soon, Coin made it so every citizen over the age of 14 had to be entered into the military and be trained in both combat and weapons, and she put one of her most trusted advisors, named Boggs, in charge of this initiative. Coin eventually started working with Plutarch, the game maker for the 75th Hunger Games, along with a few others like Haymitch, and together they formed a plan to use one of the tributes named Katniss Everdeen as the face of the rebellion, dubbing her the Mockingjay to help lead others to join their cause. During the 75th Hunger Games, they pulled Katniss and Finnick O'Dare out of the arena, but left Peta, Joanna, and Enoberia behind, letting them get captured by the capital. In retaliation right after this, the capital bombed Katniss's home, District 12, and though many people died, luckily Katniss's best friend Gale got a large group of the district out before that happened, and Coin welcomed the surviving District 12 citizens, though this was not out of kindness, but rather to grow their strength and to have more fertile people in their midst. Now that they had Katniss, Coin had plans for her to make speeches encouraging people to fight and encouraging rebels to persevere in their struggle. Queen worked closely with Plutarch and the other rebel leaders to make these speeches for Katniss, but as time went on and Katniss still hadn't agreed to be the Mockingjay, Queen became very frustrated with Katniss and one day told the rebel leaders that they should have rescued Peta instead of her, as she thought that he'd be a better figurehead. Right away, we see parallels between Coin and Snow himself, the most obvious being that they're both presidents, one for Pan Am and the other for District 13, or more accurately, she's basically the president for the rebellion. Both of these presidents at one point have wanted Katniss to be a figurehead for their side, making her follow scripts, smiling, and waving. When you and Peter are on tour, you need to smile. You need to be grateful. But above all, you need to be madly prepared to end it all in love. You think you can manage that? 
Snow did this, telling her to sell her relationship with Peta to stop people from rising up and rebelling, and Coin used her to do the complete opposite, trying to incite the rebellion. Even her last name, Coin, has a deeper meaning, because though she and Snow are on opposing sides in the battle, and though they're opposites, they both end up using the same tactics, being two sides of the same coin. When the Capitol broadcasted an interview with Peta to all of Pan Am, Peta said that they needed to cease fire, something that immediately made Coin see him as a traitor. This made it all the more irritating for her when Katniss came to her with conditions that felt more like demands if she was going to be the Mockingjay. Quinn agreed to let Katniss's sister Prim have her cat. She agreed to let Katniss and Gale hunt above ground in the woods. But the demand that was most irritating to Quinn was that Katniss asked to pardon Peta, Joanna, and Enoberia after the war ended. Something that Quinn flat out rejected, saying that Peta and the others would be tried as war criminals. Quinn eventually agreed very reluctantly, however, despite her fury of granting immunity to Peta, who had just called for a ceasefire. Katniss's final request was to kill Snow, and this made Quinn smile grimly before saying that they'd have to flip for it. Another example that shines the light on the deeper meaning of her name, Coin. Coin and the other rebel leaders decided to stick to the story of Katniss and Peta's fake love story, and would continue to say that Gale was Katniss's cousin, the same thing the Capitol reporters did during the games. And in the book, it states that Katniss is surprised with Coin's willingness to manipulate her public appearance. This is yet another example of how similar Coin and Snow are, because in fighting Snow, Coin becomes just as manipulative, untrustworthy, and tyrannical as he was. We get a good look at the way Coin runs her government, and it's ruthless. She makes sure that any act, no matter how small, will be met with punishment, and the prime example of this is Katniss's prep team being locked up for stealing food. Katniss realizes that Coin is sending a message to all of them, comply with the rules of District 13, or face the consequences. This is Coin's version of Snow leaving the White Roses to send Katniss a message. And clearly, Coin's way of sending a message is much more brutal, locking up those close to Katniss naked, bruised, and underfed. This makes Snow leaving roses around for Katniss to find seem very tame. Coin seems to believe that everything she does, the torturing, the killing, the imprisoning, and so on, is justified on the grounds that the Capitol is doing the same thing. The problem with Quinn's reasoning, however, is that by doing what the Capitol is doing, the rebels lose any sense of the moral high ground in the war. The Capitol is evil and corrupt, and because Quinn is doing what they're doing, so are the rebels. Right before Quinn was about to make her speech announcing that Katniss had agreed to be the Mockingjay, Katniss demanded that she put Annie Cresta's name on the immunity list as well, and Quinn agreed. Coin then gave her speech, telling the crowd that Katniss had agreed to be the face of the rebellion, but she told them that in return, Katniss had demanded that Peta, Joanna, Annie, and Enoberia be granted immunity. This led the crowd to boo and jeer, angry because they wanted to see who they considered to be war criminals punished for their treason, especially Peta. At the end of this chapter, Katniss realizes that she's under a strict contract of loyalty and cooperation with Coin, and if she steps out of line, she and her friends are as good as dead. Because just like the message she was sending by locking her prep team up, Coin will get rid of you if she has no use for you, or if you don't follow her rules. In strictly political terms, Coin's speech is absolutely brilliant. It creates a distance between Katniss and the citizens of 13, and in essence, Coin makes Katniss both the figurehead and the fall guy. This is diabolically clever on Quinn's part, as she is using Katniss in the present, making her the face of the rebellion, while protecting herself from Katniss in the future by making her the fall guy. Because now that she's disliked by the citizens for not following their rigid rules of punishment, it eliminates any chance of those citizens wanting Katniss to take Quinn's place as their leader. And in turn, Quinn ensures she can hold onto her power with no real threat of Katniss taking it. After this, Katniss for the first time realizes how similar Coin is to Snow, and being on the inside, she knows how powerful Coin is, having nuclear missiles and a vast army of soldiers, something that terrifies Katniss. After realizing that Katniss was awful at being inspiring when it was staged, they came up with the idea of sending Katniss into the field to get a real performance, and Coin loved the idea of putting Katniss into real danger. Coin, once again thinking rather heartlessly, thinks that even if Katniss is killed, she would still be a martyr for their cause. Katniss ends up acting the hero, and they got some great footage, which Coin was very excited to air. District 13 hijacked the Capitol's TV, and their video was shared all across the country. When it became clear that District 13 was about to be bombed, we see a bright side to the efficiency and occasional tyranny of President Coin's regime, because when there's a crisis, she knows how to react, and this time, she got everyone safely underground to the bunkers. Afterwards, there were some damages, but Coin got her people through it and did what had to be done. 
Queen executed a rescue mission to retrieve those that were being held in the capital, and her team successfully brought Peta, Joanna, and Annie back. Peta, however, was brainwashed by the capital and was made to think that Katniss was his greatest enemy. If he got near her, he would viciously attack her. After Katniss was injured in the field, Queen told her that she could not go on a mission to the capital, saying that she was too important to the cause. But moments later, Queen told Katniss that if she heals enough, she would be allowed to go. The fact that she started off saying no because Katniss was important to then changing her mind seconds later is a pretty rapid reversal, and it clearly shows that she manipulates people by saying what comes off to be kind, but in reality, she would welcome Katniss's death, which is why she agreed to send her into the field. This becomes even more set in stone when a few months later when Katniss did go on a mission to the capital, Queen sent Peta to join their team. Looking at the book and Katniss's thoughts, right away she thought that Peta's mind was still not fixed completely and Katniss actually thought to herself if Queen wanted her dead. Katniss had realized the way Queen worked a long time ago and she knew that if Queen had no use for you, she would off you. And right now, Katniss realized that Queen no longer had a reason to keep her alive with the war coming to a close and thus, she sent Peta in the hopes that he would kill her. And Katniss was spot on with this. Because the war was coming to an end, Queen was looking to consolidate her power, and Katniss, a charismatic leader, would be a major threat to her after the capital was defeated. When it looked like Katniss and the rest of the group were killed in the capital, Queen herself went on TV and said to the entire country of Panem that Katniss would be a symbol for the rebellion, dead or alive. This is a disturbing moment, because it proves that Coin doesn't need Katniss alive. She's just as good a symbol for the rebel cause while dead. And we as an audience know that Katniss's death for Coin only fuels her corruption, now thinking that her biggest rival for power is gone. Coin put an end to the war, but she did it in a way that showed how ruthless she really was. When there was a huge crowd of people at the Gate of Snow's mansion, and children in the front of that crowd, Coin ordered a hovercraft to drop bombs disguised as supplies. After the explosion went off and people ran in to help, including Katniss's sister Prim, who Coin had purposely placed there, a second explosion went off, killing Prim and many, many more. Coin, however, made it look as though it was Snow who had done this, and in turn, it turned the entire country, including the capital, against him. The rebels then captured Snow, capitalizing on the end of the fight. After the bombing, Coin visited Katniss in the hospital, telling her that she had captured President Snow for her, though at this point, Katniss was unaware of the horrible way in which she did this. Coin announced Snow's execution to the public and said that Katniss would be the one to carry out this execution. When Katniss visited the locked up Snow, however, Snow exposed Coin. Snow told Katniss that if he had a hovercraft, he would have used it to escape, not drop bombs, and therefore, the only logical person who would have done this was Coin. Although Snow was an untrustworthy and villainous figure, his logic is impeccable in this section of the novel. We've already seen that Coin is capable of great cruelty and brutality if she thinks it will help her gain power. All of this makes Katniss think who benefits from the bombing and who doesn't, and the answer is easy. Coin benefits enormously, and Snow doesn't benefit at all. Snow concludes his explanation, urging Katniss to see Coin's genius. From the beginning, it was District 13 that first rebelled against the capital. Then later, District 13, led by Coin, encouraged the other districts to fight the capital, and in turn, both the capital and the districts weakened themselves as Coin stood back and watched. Finally, Coin tricked Snow into devoting far too much time and attention into fighting Katniss. When he was completely focused on her, she made her strike to frame him for her own heinous acts. But the most ingenious part of Coin's plan was that while she manipulated both the capital and the districts to fight one another, she swooped in, allowing District 13, and in turn, herself, to seize power quickly and easily at the proper time. It was all just a waiting game for Coin. After her conversation with Snow, Katniss came to the realization that Coin had sent Prim into the fight even though she was only 13, a year younger than you have to be to join the military at 14. And Katniss later found out that one more of her friends was almost killed by Coin, but Hamish and Plutarch fought her and talked her down from taking Effie Trinket's life. Many rebels were calling for the murder of the capital citizens, but Coin rejected this on the grounds that they needed people for repopulation. Looking deeper at this, with Coin taking over, very little changes would be made to Pan Am. There would still be cruel, corrupt people in power who placed little value on human lives, and Coin even began to reinstate the Hunger Games for the capital citizens' children. Tyranny itself would not go away. It would only change its name from Snow to Coin. Coin later hosted a meeting with the surviving Hunger Games competitors to vote on the idea of this Hunger Games for the capital citizens. After the vote went in favor of doing this, Coin announced that the Hunger Games would be carried out soon. When it came time for the execution, Katniss realized that Snow was telling the truth and that Coin was no better than him, and maybe even worse. 
As everybody watched, she pointed the arrow away from Snow, instead aiming it at Coin, and let the arrow fly. The new rebel leader was hit in the chest by the very arrow that she had provided the Mockingjay, and she fell to the ground. As Coin lay there dead, Snow, the man that she bore so much in common with, was killed as well. Both of them did terrible things, and it could very well be argued that Coin was even worse than Snow. Either way, both of them got the endings that they deserved. Their climb to power was their ultimate downfall. Coin used Katniss a great deal to secure her power, and it's poetic that she fell at the hands of the Mockingjay, the very thing that she helped create. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and see more of this little dude. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook for Movie Flame updates. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you press that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great videos on the way.